came across a quote in the magazine, or at least the website of the magazine, Christianity Today. Uh, and it was this. Uh, the number one cause of atheism is Christians. Uh, those who proclaim God with their mouths and deny him with their lifestyles is what an unbelieving world finds simply unbelievable. And I think that Jesus might have said a similar thing on this particular occasion that we've read about in Luke chapter 11. He might have said the number one cause of, number one cause of paganism in the first century is Pharisees. Uh, these people who proclaim God with their mouths and deny him with their lifestyles is what a pagan world finds simply unbelievable. That might seem a little bit harsh, but actually uh, the words that Jesus uses in the actual uh, account that we read are possibly even tougher than that because he says the moral to you, Pharisees. Uh, in Matthew's account in chapter 23, in Matthew, uh, the words are, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Because clearly in this passage, Jesus is attacking hypocrisy. Uh, there are a number of different definitions of hypocrisy, all basically saying the same thing. The one I came across was this. Uh, Hypocrisy is a pretense of having a, a virtuous character, moral or religious beliefs or principles that one does not really possess. And that was the Pharisees. They were one thing on the inside and another thing completely on the outside. They were hypocrites. And of course, we remember the word hypocrites is, is a word that was used for actors in those days. Uh, you were acting a part, but that wasn't the real you. And, and that was, as far as Jesus was concerned, you know, the Pharisees. And one very small thing happened here that led Jesus to explain the problem graphically and brutally. Uh, there was a positive thing that had happened. One of the Pharisees had invited him for a meal. It was a hospitable thing to do. However, he noticed that Jesus did not wash, did not wash his hands before the meal and was surprised. And those of us that are parents uh, will know how ready we are or have been in the past. We've actually more or less got past this stage. Uh, Jamie's already trained up. He knows he's supposed to wash his hands before a meal and so he'll be doing that when he gets to Edinburgh. But how quick we are to point that out to our kids. Go and wash your hands. The Pharisee didn't say anything. Perhaps Jesus read his facial expressions or his body language uh, to appreciate what he was thinking. Or it could have been that the Holy Spirit gave him insight into the man's thoughts. Uh, that's a very dangerous gift to possess when those around you ha have something very different going on on the inside from what's going on on the outside. And Jesus uses an illustration uh, involving crockery. A and his illustration really doesn't soften uh, his reaction of brutal honesty to this man's thoughts. Because he says, your hands may be clean, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Because you're more interested in looking good uh, than in being good. And for people like the Pharisees in those days, appearances were all important. Now that all seems fairly clear. It doesn't seem like there would be many, many, much in misunderstanding. Uh, but just to be absolutely clear, to make sure that there's no confusion, Jesus provides some further details for them so that they really do understand what he's saying to them. Six times he says to them, Whoa! 
Now, the word here, the Greek word is ue. And ue was used as a word of expressing grief. So it wasn't the instruction you give to stop a horse. It was an expression of grief. Whoa! In English, we might use the word alas, or good grief, or perhaps really 21st century, it might be to say you're sad. And what was it that made Jesus feel sad about the Pharisees and the way that they lived their lives? Well, he has six woes. And the first one is he says, you're sad because you're more interested in keeping the rules than you are in your relationships with other people. Now, Jesus may have been exaggerating for effect when he says, or talks about them tithing their garden herbs, picking a herb and taking a tenth of it, giving that to God. But the more serious issue was that they were ignoring big issues like God's love and human justice. Uh, And these two things that Jesus mentions, mentions in the passage is pretty much along the lines of the two greatest commandments, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, They were kind of abandoning these two critical commandments um, and instead were focusing on self-love, self-preservation, self-glorification, self-justification by keeping the rules. And they were their rules. A lot of these rules they'd made up to suit themselves. And as we look around our world, we we see that there's a lot of damage done in the name of religion, in the name of rule-keeping. Often, principles seem to matter more to people than other people. And sadly, that can be true in churches as well. And so Jesus is encouraging us here to focus particularly on our relationships. And that's a very big part of our new-ish vision, to be God-focused, growing together, generously serving. It's about concentrating on our relationships. Not abandoning the rules that are important, but concentrating on our relationships. And second, Jesus says, you're sad, you Pharisees, because you're more concerned about your own personal status before people than before God. Uh, In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus had warned people uh, against giving and praying and fasting for effect, for the impact it would have in impressing other people. Uh, He was talking about people who announce the good things they're doing with trumpets, who do them publicly so others will know what they're doing, all the good things they're doing. They do it for the kudos, to enhance their reputation, to raise their status in the eyes of other people. Now we all know about the issues of peer pressure. We all know about worrying about what other people think about us. And that can really you know, be a big issue for some of us. When our primary concern, as Jesus is pointing out, should be God. Uh, having an audience of one. Uh, remembering that man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. And it's the heart that's the most important part of us. Uh, The human heart can be, as we all know, uh, pretty wicked. But it can be rectified through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happens, we have a new status, a new identity before God. Adopted as his children. A friend of Jesus, a member of his body, a temple of the Holy Spirit, a citizen of heaven. And compared to that new status, uh, when we walk in Jesus' way, our human reputation, the thing that the Pharisees were worried about is really nothing. It's rubbish. It's garbage. It's something we can easily leave behind. 
And then thirdly, Jesus said, you're sad because your words and actions are more likely to inflict damage on other people than to bring healing to other people. He talks about them being an unmarked grave. And in in the context then, that was the equivalent of being like a booby trap to other people or a, a hidden mine. According to Numbers 19 in the Old Testament, uh, a person would be rendered unclean, spiritually unclean, if they had contact with a dead body. And Jesus is effectively saying to these people that you may be physically alive, but you're spiritually dead. And the infection that's still on you is, is affecting other people. It's, it's contagious. And it's easily caught by the unsuspecting people that you are supposedly leading. Uh, when I was on holiday just last week, lying on a beach in Turkey, it's a hard life I know, um, with a book, I had some books with me. One of my books uh, was uh, The People's History of the United States. Uh, just to help me kind of understand where Amy is coming from as a citizen of that country now. Uh, about 700 pages, uh, so a pretty heavy tome, and a uh, very balanced account, surprisingly negative in many ways towards the, the leadership of that nation, I'm sorry to say, Amy. Um, one of the big issues that it mentions has a whole kind of chapter and a bit uh, about the treatment of the Anglo-Saxon colonists from our own country and other European nations towards the Native Americans. Uh, how they kind of hounded them out of their territory, uh, killed them, marginalized them, just did all sorts of horrendously cruel things to those people. Their, their population of the Native Americans collapsed uh, as colonization went on. Um, and at one point later on in the process, one particular tribe had ended up in this uh, small, uh, poor area, this reservation where they'd been herded to uh, and given as though generously by the colonists. Uh, they were poor, they didn't have very much, the winter was coming on, uh, they, they didn't even have enough to keep themselves warm. And in an act of apparent compassion and generosity, uh, the local colonist communion, uh, community said, well here, here's a whole lot of blankets. So they brought a whole lot of blankets in. These blankets had come from a, a, a hospital which had housed um, folks that had suffered and died of smallpox. And of course the blankets still contained uh, the spore, whatever it is smallpox comes in. Uh, And it completely devastated that tiny little weak, uh, marginalized Native American community and killed um, more than half of them. Apparently a compassionate action, but actually it was just more of the same. And the Pharisees were a little bit like that, apparently doing good for folks, but actually uh, there was a booby trap. There was something bad hidden in the message that they were sharing. I wonder what booby traps we hide. Uh, What infections are people likely to pick up from us? Do we carry death or life? Do we cause hurt or healing? Do we offer bad news or good news to people when they have contact with us? Some of the guests that were at this dinner, it wasn't just a a one-on-one, maybe all of the guests that were there were a bit upset at these three uh, woes that Jesus shared, these things that he was sad about. And there were some experts uh, of the law slightly distinct group from the Pharisees. And one of them complained that Jesus was insulting them too in what he was saying. In our culture today, you know, we would say, no, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't uh, offending you at all, I wasn't including you in what I was saying. But Jesus wants to make sure that they felt insulted. <laughs> so he shared three more woes to include them as well and make sure they were covered. And so he has another rule. You're sad because you add to people's burdens 
rather than inspiring their joy. The teachers of the, of the law brought grief to people, not joy. They ground people down rather than building them up. Uh, they did this with a thousand different rules and their criticism of those who failed to keep them. Uh, and yet they themselves were always on the lookout for loopholes to lighten the load on themselves. People really don't need added burdens. Most people have enough burdens to be going on with without any more. They, needed, they need God's grace. They need beauty, not ashes. They need gladness instead of mourning. They need praise instead of despair. They need a double portion instead of shame. They need a godly inheritance instead of disgrace. And then, according to Isaiah 61, everlasting joy will be theirs. And that, of course, was just what Jesus offered. He quoted those verses uh, in the synagogue at Nazareth one day uh, as the basis of his ministry. And then a fifth step. You're sad because you honor God's messengers from the past, but you reject God's message today. And it's the same message. And because we know from the Bible, many of the old prophets of the Old Testament have been rejected, persecuted, even killed. But now they were honored. They're dead, so they're safe, so let's honor them. But now the new messengers were coming. The new prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, and they too would be persecuted, hounded, and murdered. Uh, they were rejecting these new messengers because they didn't like the message. And once again here, we read of them opposing Jesus fiercely and questioning him zealously. Well, God's apostles and prophets are worthy of honor, for through them we have the scriptures in our Bibles today. But as we honor God's messengers, we need to be obedient to God's message so that when Christ comes again, we will be unlike the teachers of the law. We will recognize him and welcome him with open arms. And then there's a final rule. You're sad, teachers of the law, because your ignorance and disobedience is blocking the entrance of others into the kingdom. The experts in the law, you know, they, they were delving into the Hebrew Bible. They knew it back to front. They had the key to knowledge. But they had hidden it away so nobody else could enter. Now perhaps they thought that the key was the law of Moses and that had led them into legalism to think that just Keeping all the rules was the solution. Uh, believing like the Pharisees that rules were far more important than relationships. But all of this stuff that they were teaching was leading people away from God and not drawing them towards God. The key that they were using was locking people up and then being thrown away. Now the irony and tragedy of this dinner engagement was that the key, the real key, was reclining there with them. But they didn't recognize him from God's prophetic word that they knew so well. They had read about God's Messiah, his anointed one that was promised. They'd read about the suffering servant in the prophet Isaiah. But they didn't make the connection between these words written down and the living word that was sitting next to them. Jews sometimes ask the question, well, if Jesus is the Messiah and the whole law is about him, why is his name never mentioned? Well, his name is worth mentioned. Because the words, the English word salvation, is a translation of the Hebrew word Yeshua. Yeshua is, is Jesus' name. And so in Isaiah 62, for example, in verse 11, we read, 
or it can be translated, say to the daughter of Zion, see, your Jesus comes. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. And here he is, their salvation, their Jesus. He's sitting right next to them at the dinner table. The key to, the, to knowledge, the one who won't lock up all the rubbish inside our hearts, but will unlock it and offer healing and wholeness instead. Entry into his kingdom comes only through him. Uh, Hillary was sharing from that verse in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There he was, right there, that day for them to receive grace. And they missed it. Let's not be hypocrites like Jesus' dinner guests, his fellow guests, where the outside looks good, but the inside is full of greed and wickedness. I'm quite sure that we could go through this list of sad things and assess ourselves. Is, is that a sadness in my life? Is that a, an area of my life when what's on the outside is different from what's on the inside? Or maybe there's other things. Maybe there's things that you struggle with. That you know, know that's wrong, but actually you're putting on a, a good appearance. I'm sure every single one of us, there will be a difference between the outside and the inside. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law would say, well, just take the key, lock it up, and throw it away, and forget about it. And just stick to keeping the rules and looking good to those around you. And Jesus this morning by his Holy Spirit wants to take the key. He is the key. Unlock our hearts. And let all that stuff out. Because he has the grace to forgive all of these things. To deal with them. To help us to be different. And to come to that place where what's on the outside matches what are on the inside. Where rules are in a sense no longer important because we're guided by the Holy Spirit to, to know how we can walk in step with Him. And relationships become the most important thing for us. Where actually healing other people is more likely to happen, will happen because of that guidance from the Holy Spirit rather than damaging them. Where we'll inspire joy in other people rather than laying burdens on them too. And we do this by focusing our eyes on Jesus, following him, receiving from his unlimited pool of grace. Because Jesus is the key. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, this is an uncomfortable passage. It must have been a really awkward dinner. You know, when somebody comes along and just kind of lays into the host and his guests. And it's all true. Everything he said was true. And they knew it. And they were upset by it, Lord, because... They didn't appreciate that right there in Jesus was the solution. That the, the way that they could get their hearts sorted out before you. And Lord, we know it's true too. It's awkward. We don't like to think about these things. But we know in our hearts, Lord, that there, there, there is this big difference between what's on the inside and what's on the outside. Come by your Holy Spirit today, we pray. Identify it. You know, speak to us and... and Point out what's wrong. Encourage us to confess it. To turn away from it. To turn to you and to receive your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy and your joy. Come now we pray. In Jesus name. Amen.